Hello, today we will talk about spherical curves. A spherical curve for us is going to be a three-dimensional curve that lives in the unit sphere. One reason we care so much about this kind of curves is that for any piecewise smooth regular curve, its tangent indicatrix is a spherical curve. We will begin this lesson proving a powerful result, the hemisphere lemma. It says that if you have a spherical curve gamma whose length is strictly less than 2 pi, then it is strictly contained in a hemisphere. We present here a very elegant proof due to Stephanie Alexander. We begin assuming that gamma is parametrized by arc length and its domain is an interval of length L which is less than 2 pi. Let P be gamma of 0 and Q be gamma of L over 2. They separate the curve into pieces, gamma 0 and gamma 1. Each of them has length L over 2 which is strictly less than pi. Now we ignore gamma 0 and let x be the midpoint of P and Q in the sphere. What we do next is rotate a copy of gamma 1 by 180 degrees around x, which we call gamma 2. When we put together gamma 1 and gamma 2, they form a closed curve. If this new curve is not strictly contained in the hemisphere centered at x, then it touches the equator corresponding to the plane orthogonal to x at two antipodal points. Call these two points y and z. Since this curve goes from y to z and back, its length must be at least 2 pi, which is a contradiction. This shows that gamma 1 is strictly contained in the hemisphere centered at x. An identical argument shows that gamma 0 is contained in such hemisphere as well. One way we can reinterpret this result is saying that if a spherical curve has length strictly less than 2 pi, then there is a vector v whose inner product with the curve is strictly positive for all time. As a corollary, we have the following result, called Fenchel theorem. For any closed piecewise smooth regular curve gamma, its total curvature is at least 2 pi. To see this, recall that the total curvature of gamma equals the length of its tangent indicatrix, so if the curvature was less than 2 pi, by the hemisphere lemma there will be a direction v such that the dot product between v and t is positive for all time. Integrating this with respect to time, we get a contradiction since gamma of a equals gamma of b. A consequence of Fenchel's theorem is what we call the Korth lemma. It says that if a space curve gamma is a smooth regular with distinct endpoints, we let w be the vector that goes from the initial point to the endpoint, alpha the angle that w makes with initial velocity, and beta the angle that w makes with the final velocity, then the total curvature of gamma is at least alpha plus beta. To see this, all we need to do is apply Fenchel theorem to the curve obtained by concatenating gamma with the line that goes from gamma b to gamma a. When we analyze the trajectory of the tangent indicatrix of this closed curve, we see that it first follows the trajectory of the tangent indicatrix of gamma, then it adjusts by an angle of pi minus beta to point towards gamma a, and once it comes back, it adjusts again by pi minus alpha to coincide with the initial direction. Cancelling 2 pi from both sides of the equation, we obtain the result. The chord lemma has a discrete analog that applies to piecewise linear curves. If one has five distinct points, a, b, c, d, x, in the space, then the total curvature of the arc a, b, c, d is less or equal than the total curvature of the arc a, b, x, c, d. This means that if we introduce a new point to a piecewise linear curve, then the total curvature cannot decrease. To prove this other lemma, we consider a point y between a and b, and the point z between c and d. When we replace a by y and d by z in the piecewise linear curve a, b, x, c, d, we don't change the total curvature, as the new curve has the same directions in the same order. Applying the chord lemma to the curve y, b, x, c, z, d, we obtain that it is at least the sum of the angles z, y, b, and y is dc. By taking complementary angles, this is 2 pi minus the angles a y is d and y is d d. And as y approaches b and z approaches c, these two angles approach the angles a b c and b c d, which are 2 pi minus the total curvature of a b c d. 
Combining the two expressions, we conclude that the total curvature of ABCD is at most the total curvature of ABXD. A powerful consequence of the curved lemma is this theorem. It says that if we begin with a piecewise smooth regular curve gamma, its total curvature is the supremum of the total curvatures among the piecewise linear curves inscribed in gamma. By the first chord lemma, the total curvature of gamma is at least the total curvature of any inscribed piecewise linear curve, so we obtain one inequality. The other one follows by taking a sequence gamma n of piecewise linear curves inscribed in gamma obtained from finer and finer partitions. I'll leave it to you to check that the sequence of tangent indicatrices of gamma n converges pointwise to the tangent indicatrix of gamma. By the lower semi-continuity of length, that implies that the total curvature of gamma is at most the limit of the total curvatures of the curves of the sequence. The theorem is recovered by combining these two equations. Now this theorem finishes off the problem we began last lesson. For a curve inside the unit sphere, its total curvature is always at least its length. Last time we proved it for piecewise linear curves, and due to the theorem above, we can approximate any piecewise smooth curve by piecewise linear curves with arbitrarily close length and total curvature. Another cool property of spherical curves is that they have their own Crofton formulas. Note that for two vectors x and v in the unit sphere, we can project x into the equator perpendicular to v. We denote this projection as xv asterisk, and is obtained by taking the component of x perpendicular to v and then renormalizing. Of course, this will not be defined when x is either v or minus v. This projection gives us the first Crofton formula for spherical curves. For any piecewise smooth regular curve, its length is given by the average of the lengths of its projections. Notice that the integrand on the right is defined at a point v if and only if the curve doesn't pass through v. To guarantee that this happens almost everywhere, we ask the curve to be piecewise smooth regular. We will prove this Crofton formula using the theorem that characterizes the length functional. Since we are working in a smaller class of curves, we need to modify our theorem to be about piecewise smooth regular curves. Of course, we need to modify the clause about straight lines, as straight lines are not spherical curves. In the setting of spherical curves, the ones that play the role of straight lines are the segments of great circles, which are the intersections of the unit sphere with a plane passing through the origin. Now to prove our new Crofton formula, we need to replace the pointwise convergence by uniform convergence. I'll leave it to you to verify that this theorem remains true after the changes we made. The proof is exactly the same as the one we presented in the second lesson. Now we go back to the formula. All the properties listed in the theorem are straightforward to verify, except maybe the one about lower semi-continuity. If a sequence of spherical curves gamma n converges uniformly to a piecewise smooth regular curve gamma, for any v not in the image of gamma, the sequence gamma n v star converges to the curve gamma v star. By the lower semi-continuity of length, combined with Fatou's lemma, we get the lower semi-continuity of the integral expression. And by the theorem we just discussed, this implies that the formula holds for all piecewise smooth regular curves. The second spherical Crofton formula is not about projections, but about intersections. For a piecewise smooth regular curve gamma, its length is 1 fourth times the integral with respect to v of the number of intersections of gamma with the equator perpendicular to v. That is, for each v in the sphere, we count the number of times the curve gamma intersects the equator perpendicular to v and integrate this quantity over the entire sphere. The proof of this theorem requires some machinery from differential topology and measure theory, so don't worry if you need to come back to it later. To begin the proof, I leave it to you to verify that the formula holds if gamma is a portion of an equator. By concatenation, it will also hold for piecewise linear curves. For an arbitrary piecewise smooth regular curve gamma, we can find the sequence gamma n of inscribed piecewise linear curves such that gamma n plus 1 refines gamma n for each n, and the length of gamma n converges to the length of gamma as n goes to infinity. By Sartre's theorem, for almost all directions v in S2, 
the equator V verb intersects gamma and gamma n transversally for all n. For these v's, the number of intersections between v perp and gamma n increases as n goes to infinity to the number of intersections between v perp and gamma. Then by Levi monotone convergence theorem, the integrals corresponding to gamma n converge to the integral corresponding to gamma. Since we knew that the length of gamma n converges to the length of gamma, and the formula holds true for piecewise linear curves, the result follows for arbitrary piecewise smooth regular curves. And that's it for today, see you next time.